Washington Affairs Committee being held October 5th, 2020 at 7 p.m. via teleconference. As Chairman of the Personnel Administrative Affairs Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that we are providing public access to the meeting by phone with additional access possibilities by video or other electronic means. We are utilizing Zoom and the meeting link can be found on the agenda as well on the city's website. You can also join by telephone by dial in 1-929-205-6Z, 60, I'm sorry, 99, meeting ID 847-3812-7. Eight two and passcode zero two six nine two five. The public may also view this meeting on Comcast channel sixteen. We previously gave notice to the public of the necessary information for accessing the meeting through public posting. Instructions have also been provided on the City of Nash's website at www nash.gov and publicly noticed at City Hall in the Nasha Public Library. If anybody has a problem accessing the meeting via phone or channel 16, please call 603-821-2049 and they will help you connect. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting via the me methods mentioned above, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be by roll call. Let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state whether there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. Alderwoman Kelly, would you please call the roll? Alderman Clemens. Thank you. I am um, present this evening at home. I can hear everybody. And my uh, wife is here with me uh, this evening. Alderman Lopez. Hello, I'm here. I'm, uh, I can hear and see everybody, um, and I'm alone. Alderwoman Kelly is here. I am alone. And I can hear everyone. Alderman Cleaver. I'm here, and I'm, uh, I'm alone for the most part. My daughter's in and out of the room in uh, social distancing, according to the governor's orders. And Alderman Karen? Yes, I am here, I am alone, and I can hear everyone. All members of the community are present. I also see in attendance Alderman Wilshire, Alderman Dowd, Alderman Laws, Alderman Liu, and the mayor. Oh, Alderman Klee. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So we will start with a public comment. I know that there was at least one person that was looking. Uh, public comment is for conversation concerning those items that will be acted upon this evening. If you have public I'll comment, can you? Yeah, I'm looking. I, I don't see anyone raising their hand. Okay. I am Shoshana. <clears throat> I'm a state representative, Catherine Safakitis from Ward 7 in Nashua, and I am speaking tonight 
in favor of the motion to uh, substitute um, Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, it's a it's a time it's a it's an activity that the time has come. Many people in this part of the country, especially, believe that the continent's history started with colonialization. And um, sitting here in New Hampshire, steeped with European colonial history, it is often easy to overlook those indigenous people who were here long before um, the Vikings and the European explorers. Archaeological findings have confirmed their existence um, 11,000 years ago. Here in the Northeast, in, in New Hampshire, we had the Nashua, Penacook, Winnipesaukee, Pigwacket, Sokoki, Kawasak, and Ossipee, among others. All spoke dialects of the Abenaki language, a subdivision of the Eastern Algonquin language. They did not own the land. They hunted and fished in their homeland area. They lived in small family bands and joined to form tribes and confederations as their needs dictated. By the late 1600s, their population was declining due to interactions that brought sickness to tribes and skirmishes for land. Between 1650 and 1620, 16, sorry, 1615 and 1620, there were epidemics of flu and smallpox. The tribes were dying off, so many of them left and went into Quebec. Still a remnant of Abenaki descendants remain here in New Hampshire, including present day, our present day state. They are working hard to preserve their customs, language, and culture. Their current status is as a pre-constitutional tribe that has filed for federal recognition with the Bureau of Indian Affairs petition number 151. They were originally recognized by George Washington as the nation was being formed. I believe that it's vitally important to honor our indigenous peoples and recognize the rich history they have given us and the contributions they continue to make. We are a state rich with indigenous names for towns, lakes, and rivers. It just remains for us to honor them. Thank you. Catherine, would you please state your address for oh, the record? Yes, 54 yes. Market Street. Thank you. Anyone else with public comment? I do not see in one alderman, Karen. Okay, fine. Communication. There are none. Okay, interviews. Um, Mayor, I hear you're here. So would you like to um Yes, ma'am. Some... Um good to okay. good to see you. Good to see you. Glad you're doing well. Uh so we'll start with the master plan committee. We Is will. Jonathan here to... uh, <clears throat> as uh, you've already seen, uh, Madam Chair, a number of appointments for the master planning committee. Uh, we're appointing okay one from each ward, as well as other groups are, are designating people. But tonight we have uh, my nominee for Ward 1, who is uh, Rabbi Jonathan spiris Avet. I think you all know uh, Rabbi John because he is such a prominent and well-known member of the community. He's been at uh, Temple Beth Abraham for about a dozen years, has several kids in the school district. Uh, and over these past years has established himself as a strong moral leader for the community, as well as, of course, a religious leader. Uh, he's been very active in the, uh, in the Interfaith Council, where he is now chair. He also is very interested in affordable housing, uh, given our housing shortage at all, all levels of affordability. Uh, is very concerned about less fortunate people uh, in the city. Uh, a number of causes he's involved in, one that I've been present at for a number of years is the crop walk over uh, 
which uh, always launches from the uh, from the temple. In any event, he will represent Ward One, and I'm sure uh, will be a very important addition to our master planning efforts. And I see uh, uh, Rabbi John is on the call right now, and so I guess I will turn it over to him and ask him to say a few words about why he thinks he'd like to be on the committee and why he thinks the master planning effort uh, might be important. Thank you, Mia. Uh, Rabbi? Thank you so much. That was, back. yeah, can you hear me? <laughs> that was, uh, thank you. And Mayor Donches, it's so good to see you and, and uh, hope you're doing well. Hope and, you're doing well. Honored to be with uh, with all of you, my uh, representatives of the city. That was that was quite a tribute. Um, I guess what I will just add to that is I think the the idea of a city as a as a whole organism that connects people who live in all parts of it. I think a lot about the relationships that I have and I don't have with people who live um, even in my neighborhood, but also certainly in all the other neighborhoods. Um, and uh, master plan is partly a way of thinking about. Uh, the fabric of the city as a set of relationships that could be deeper, um, both which is good in its own right, but also I think helps us make just better decisions overall, where we don't all um, just seek our own our own interests or the interests of people who like to do the things we like, but really knit us together more and uh, and teach us a lot more about each other. Um, I I am fortunate to partake of not only the things the mayor mentioned, but uh, the arts um, in the city, both through my kids who've been involved in. Uh, in youth theater and music. And uh, my wife has served on the, the board of the symphony. And um, I really um, am eager to help sort of look at this as a, I think what I'm bringing to this is not necessarily a, a, a lot of expertise that isn't already there, but just this kind of perspective of asking um, all the time, well, how does this, how does this help us connect? How does this not just, uh, I mentioned that the, I was at the meeting of the commission of the committee uh, last week, I guess. And I said, you know, a lot of times we show up to things and uh, we might be in the same place, but it's sort of parallel parallel play. And uh, so how do we come and, and create spaces and create opportunities where we really enrich our relationships? Um, I see Steve here and, uh, you know, that's why I go to the Riverwalk Cafe. I go, I go to meet someone I want to meet and then I inevitably see somebody else um, who, who either I know and I meet the person they know. And uh, how do we sort of spread that kind of ethic out and make that a, a microcosm for our Make the city a macrocosm of what goes on there at the at the cafe, which I miss, uh, which I miss tremendously. Um, I'd be happy to answer questions. I don't know if that's uh, uh, what we do here, but uh, tell you anything more about myself. Um, I do have a background um, in uh, sociology and in uh, kind of social and political theory, for whatever that might be worth, and uh, am am tremendously fascinated uh, by by urban planning and design. Okay, do we have any questions from members of the committee? Alderman Lopez. Alderman Lopez. Uh, yeah, I was just curious what your opinion is on the city's um, current um, approach to affordable housing, um, low-income housing, uh, and how you see that uh, becoming a relevant topic of discussion in the master planning process. Sure. Um, I, it is something that I know is already on the, the agenda. Um, I know it's something that uh, both Sarah Marchand and Community Development and the Housing Authority are, are involved in. Um, the group that uh, the mayor mentioned, the, the Interfaith Housing Justice Group, has been um, connecting through the, uh, the Bronstein Project and, uh, and interacting with some of you already around the School Street Project. And um, we are both... Um, um, I'm hoping that uh, this, uh, and, and actually the mayor and, and other officials have met with us. Um, in fact, tomorrow is the third in a series of meetings. We probably would have certainly have met more by now, were it not for the uh, the pandemic crisis. And um, so I think that uh, we have set, uh, our, our citizen group has set a, uh, has offered the city an audacious goal of 2,000 more units of affordable housing through, uh, through the next decade. And uh, the Bronstein project, just in pure numbers, is a uh, is a down payment on that, and we're eager to um, kind of think about. It. And I hope that being on the master plan commission will help sort of talk about more what are the different dimensions of that, both in terms of uh, 
uh, public development, private public partnerships, private developers, places in the city that uh, that will diversify. Um, so those are many of the kinds of things I want to uh, sort of bring into the conversation. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, Rabbi, we'll take up your appointment later on during the meeting. Thank you so much for offering to come sit on the Master Plan Committee. Thank you so Mayor? much. I'm honored. I'm honored. Thank you. Mayor, National Arts Commission. Mayor? You're on mute. Sorry, I got on mute somehow. Um, okay. Madam Chair, I, I've nominated two people to the National Arts Commission. The first on the agenda is Steve Rudick from City from the uh, Riverwalk Cafe. Uh, I think we all know the Riverwalk Cafe. Uh, Steve has made that a real interesting destination in the, in the city. It's really expanded the the vibe of the city quite a bit. I would say. Uh, for quite a while, he operated a music venue there, and hopefully someday after COVID-19, that can be reestablished uh, with more community participation um, maybe at, at some level. Uh, but he has always been interested in the arts and always interested in communities. He's a good chef himself, which says something good about him. Uh, he formerly was a VISTA volunteer in Danbury, Connecticut. He's formerly a lawyer as well, believe it or not. He gave up that to become the owner of Riverwalk and we have to congratulate him there. So I, I believe given his interest in the arts, in, <coughs> excuse me, in music, in uh, the culinary arts, he will be a strong addition to the Arts Commission. and. Uh, I turn it over to Steve to offer any thoughts that he may have. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you uh, Jim, for those uh, nice uh, involved in various uh, uh, nonprofits and governmental uh, uh, groups over the years. Uh, in uh, before uh, living in Amherst. Uh, it was in New Boston Conservation Commission, Amherst Land Trust, uh, um, and uh, and I've been uh, involved with the Arts Commission, the uh, committee that assigns the grants for the last couple of years. So I've gotten to know some of the arts organizations that are out there, and the uh, merits of giving uh, uh, their grants to the, these organizations. So I've enjoyed that process, um, and uh, I'm uh, very much uh, uh, following and participating with uh, um, uh, items having to do with the symphony. Um, and the general music scene uh, in the city. And uh, so uh, when uh, um, Mayor Donch has, uh, suggested I get involved and uh, Mark Thayer, I believe also was involved, I, I said, sure, I would uh, love to do it. So here I am and thanks. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, anyone from the committee who would like to ask questions? Alderman Lopez? He doesn't have his hand up yet. I don't have any questions. No. Did you guys want to ask questions? <laughs> Anyone else? No. All right, Steve. Your appointment will be voted on later on in the mid uh, meeting. And thank you for offering to uh, take part in the uh, National Arts Commission. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor. Is Travis here? Yes, I, he is. Okay, thank you. Madam, You're next. Madam Chair, my the other my next nomination to the Arts Commission uh, is Travis Terpoldi, who uh, lives in Ward Three, up uh, I believe on Manchester Street. Travis is a an engineer by profession. He works uh, in the medical device manufacturing industry, uh, but but most relevant to us, he he's already served uh, as a volunteer for the Arts Commission. The city developed an arts and cultural plan uh, a little while ago, and he was involved with that. Uh, very interested in the arts. 
and as a member of uh, the younger generation that uh, I think we, we don't have a terror, you know, huge number of people from that generation who are looking to volunteer for city government. So I, he will be a, a good addition to the Arts Commission. And I know he is, given all that he's done for the Arts Commission already, uh, he'll be very interested in participating. And with that, I'll turn you over to uh, Travis. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Travis, your turn. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, everybody, for having me, and, and thank you for that um, introduction. Um, I'm that address actually is incorrect. Um, I'm I think a member of Ward Six uh, over on Lawndale Ave, um, but I'm a new member of Nashua, um, and I'm new to um, community involvement. But um, I'm looking to make Nashua my home, and I think part of that is being involved in the community and being involved in whatever way I can. And I'm, I'm very interested in the arts. I'm not a professional um, in the arts community, but I think that that allows me to kind of bring a different perspective to the commission. So I'm really looking forward to serving on the commission and um, thank you all for having me. Thank you, Travis. Does anyone have any questions for Travis? No one? Okay, thank you, Travis. Your appointment will come up later on in the meeting for a vote. Mayor, you have the uh, Tax Increment Financing Advisory Board. Mayor? Sorry, it keeps going on mute. Uh, thank That's you, Madam okay. Chair. So next, as you suggested, we have the nomination for the TIF, Tax Increment Financing District, Advisory Board. And for that, I am nominating Angelina Spilios, who is a currently a uh, the counsel for the Crown Linen Service, which is uh, in the uh, tax increment financing district. Uh, her family owns the Crown Linen business as well as the um, Milliard Technology Mall or Milliard Technology Building, where uh, many smaller businesses are located. Now, the Tax Increment Financing District Advisory Board, uh, by law, is required to have members, uh, property owners uh, within the district to offer advice, uh, provide guidance regarding how tax increment financing might, uh, might be spent. Uh, Tim Cummings, Director of Economic Development, works closely with the advisory board. Uh, Angelina is replacing her father, Arthur, Arthur Spilios, who has served on the committee for a few years uh, since its inception, or since we expanded it to include the area of the river west of the Nashua River, the Nashua Main Street Bridge. And she is, she, Angelina, is a graduate of Wellesley College. Uh, and a, as I said, a lawyer, she went to the University of New Hampshire Law School up in in Concord. Uh, her business, uh, the Crown Linen business is of course an important uh, downtown business which employs a number of people, uh, some hundreds of people. And of course the Milliard Technology Office Park is a very important building in the Milliard. They're a member of the Milliard Association and they, as I said already, uh, they serve as the home for many smaller businesses, a uh, number of them uh, technology related businesses. So uh, given that her father wanted to step down and uh, she was willing to step into the uh, role of uh, the tax increment financing district advisory group, uh, I was very pleased that she was willing to step forward and um, I'm also pleased to be able to appoint her to the uh, position uh, that I was just discussing. And with that, I see uh, Ms. Spileos is on the, in the call, and I will just turn it over to her to introduce herself. Thank you, Mayor. Angelina? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Donches, for that introduction. I really appreciate it. So, yes, exactly um, as Mayor Donches said, um, my father, Arthur, has really enjoyed being on the committee. 
Um, it's something that's very important to us with our business being so closely tied in with the Nashua River and we are right there in the thick of everything and um, we love being downtown. We care about what's going to happen with the riverfront project and my dad just wants to step back a little bit. He's semi-retired at this point and um, we thought it would be great if I could be considered to step into his shoes with it. So um, basically, just as Mayor Donch has said, um, you know, we, we, we being a business right on the riverfront, we want to see the city, you know, maximize everything with um, just what a wonderful asset the Nashua River is. And um, I'd love to get more involved. I've sat in on a couple of the TIF committee meetings so far, and I'm just familiarizing myself with everything that's going on with the project. And um, I love going to work there every day. And it's something that um, is very special to me being a part of the Nashua community. So I'd love to be able to offer our perspective um, as the project is underway and, and take it from there. Thank you. Uh, any questions from committee members? Alderman Lopez and then myself. Uh, yeah, I was interested in your book. Uh, it looks like it's in the resume. It's in your resume um, yes. sort of book regarding no good deed goes unpunished, uh, and it's in reference to New Hampshire uh, attorneys' larger role in establishing nonprofits. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. So um, I wrote that as my student note on the law review, um, my um, second um, semester of my second year in law school. And I had heard about um, a case here in Nashua with a nonprofit, and it was just something that I thought was interesting. I did more research about it, and I learned more about um, what the state attorney general's role is with nonprofits and um, what happens when um, you know somebody who passes away, they have wishes for what happens to um, their assets or how they want to donate their money and assets to a nonprofit and what happens if the purpose um, of that can't be fulfilled anymore and how the state attorney general can make a lot of decisions. Um, even if there are other interested parties that might be involved, they really don't have standing to bring a lawsuit. So that's kind of what that research was about. Okay. I was just curious because we recently had an issue with our, um, with funding that was assigned to, was intended for um, Nashua. Um, on behalf of a performing arts center steering committee that just appeared to whittle away over time. And ultimately that funding did not stay with Nashville, it went to Manchester. So okay. um, that's just an element of, um, of curiosity because it was relevant to the city. Um, looking forward to the TIF specifically and developing the Mill Yard area. Um, what are your opinions uh, with regards to the Animal Park uh, pr initiative, I guess, proposal? Um, I guess, doubling down on your Milliard uh, Association experience. Sure. So um, I have to be honest, I'm, I'm not as familiar with that particular initiative with the Animal Park. Um, I've just gotten back involved with the Milliard Association after being away from it for several years when I was in law school. Um, so I just joined the last couple of meetings for that. And I, um, I'm still sort of figuring out everything that's going on with that at this point. So I'm just and I'm going to take everything in and, um, you know, see what the information is. I'm sorry, I don't really have more specific knowledge about it at this point. That's fair. It's not, um, I don't think it's germane to the TIF specifically because uh, I don't believe they're looking for any TIF money. But um, we are a group of um, passionate uh, Nashuans have come forward to try to organize a citywide effort to, to introduce uh, dog parks. There's a piece of land that the Milliard Association. Um, is not negotiating exactly, but um, discussing with the with that advisory board um, to decide whether or not it could be used as a dog park. Uh, it's below the floodplain, so its development options are fairly limited. Um, more recently, uh, that committee has needed to get money from the city in order to fund a feasibility study, in order to make the case more strongly to the Milliard Association um, that that is. Uh, a worthwhile and, and viable endeavor. And it's an example of how similarly to the Performing Arts Center um, program I referenced before, a group of passionate citizens can, can have an idea and a dream 
but it sometimes takes a partnership between the city, um, a business entity, and then within the cons confines of, of legal managing to actually make that project come about. Um, so that was kind of why I brought it up. Um, but I mean, if it's not something you're immediately familiar with, I don't think it's relevant to the TIF district, strictly speaking. Um, as, as far as I know, they're not looking for that kind of funding. Sure. No, that's okay. I'm, I'm glad you brought it up and I've heard a little bit about it, but I'm just not um, super familiar with it yet. But anything like that, um, my, my father and I always strongly feel that we want to work with the city and, um, you know, we all share the common goal of wanting to, um, like you said, when a group of people come together for something they're passionate about and, um, you know, we've worked really well with Mayor Donchis and other folks at the city with the boat ramp that we have on our property and um, that's gone really well with um, having people utilize that. And so we, you know, we look forward to exploring other things like that as well, especially anything through the Milliard Association. So the boat ramp is actually a much better example than the other two that I was, I was kind of fishing around for. Um, the boat ramp is where a private uh, owner and association in the city have all collaborated and it's really provided an amenity to, that is being um, well used by the city. Um, even as recently as the light parade, I mean, that really wouldn't have been possible without that, that area for access. Um, right. So that's a really good example. Um, I guess I, my only suggestion is there's a lot happening in Nashville, even a small slice of it like the mill yard. Um, so there's always going to be a new project or a new thing coming up. So as long as you're versatile, I'm sure you'll be, you'll see them all coming by. Yes, that's a good point. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for being willing to volunteer and step forward. Oh, thank you. Alderwoman, Alderwoman Kelly, you wanted to speak? I'm cut it off. No, <laughs> I actually just wanted to comment and say thank you uh, for stepping forward. It sounds like uh, your family has been involved and you're, you know, up to date on what's going on and can bring a fresh perspective. So thank, thank you. you for that. You sound very passionate too. So I thank appreciate you. that. Thanks. I appreciate that too. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Alderman Karen? Yes, Alderman, Alderman Wilshire. Thank you. Thank you, um, Angelina, for stepping up to do this. Unfortunately, we'll miss Arthur because he's such a great guy. But thank, thank you. you for stepping up in his place. And uh, we look forward to working with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank hi you. to I, look forward to I will. Thank you. Yes, he says hi to everybody. We're so glad to see the mayor, too. We've been worried about how the mayor is doing. So it's nice, nice to see everybody and everybody looking well. And Arthur says hello too. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Alderman Wilshire. Angela, your uh, nomination will come under vote later on in the meeting. And thank okay. you for volunteering. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Moving on, we have application to license talkers, peddlers, vendors license. Karen N. Thank you. Appointments by the mayor. Alderwoman Kelly. I move to recommend the following confirmation reappointments to the Cultural Connections Committee. Eric Druart with the term to expire December 31st, 2020. Mohammed Mostak Arif with the term to expire February 28th, 2023. Adelina Hernandez with the term to expire July 30th, 2023 and Jessica Gorhan with a term to expire December 31st, 2023. And the following new appointment to the Master Plan Committee, Jonathan Spiro Savat, the following to the National Arts Commission, Judith Carlson, reappointment, Paula Flam, reappointment, and Travis Tripoldi, new appointment, all with terms to expire April 1st, 2023. And Steve Reddick, new appointment with a term to expire July 30th, 2023. And Angelina Spilios, new appointment to the Tax Increment Financing Advisory Board with a term to expire September 30th, 2021, 2021, 2021 by roll call. Okay, would you please call the roll? Alderman Karen. Yes. Alderman Clemens. Yes. Alderman Lopez. Yes. Alderwoman Kelly is a yes. Alderman Cleaver. Yes. You have five yeas and zero nays. Okay, motion carried. Unfinished business. There is none. Okay, new business resolutions. 
we have before us R2077, renaming Columbus Day as Indigenous People Day in Nashua. Okay. Alderwoman Kelly, would you make a motion? Oh yeah, I have to make a motion, don't I? I move yeah. to recommend final passage by roll call. Okay. All right. Any uh, comments, questions? I saw that. From anyone? Alderman, yeah, we got Alderman Clemens and Alderman Lopez. Okay. Alderman Clemens. Uh, thank you. I um, want to uh, thank the sponsor of this, uh, Alderwoman Kelly, for bringing this forward. Um, I think it's a, a great endeavor. Um, it's about time we we stopped celebrating Christopher Columbus. Um, he's not worthy of of the celebrations, um, you know. And it's it, some people look at this as your. Italians find it to be almost an Italian heritage day and I get that and I understand that. Um, however, when you look at the context of history and what uh, that man uh, did to the native population versus um, anything that he positively brought to uh, this side of the world, I think it's uh, clear, clear, in my opinion, uh, that we should stop honoring him and start honoring the people who were here before him um, and the people who uh, really uh, unfortunately were um, you know victims i guess of of european colonization so uh, with that uh, i'm happy to uh, to support this it's a small token of what we can do um, it doesn't take much effort on our part, but it at least, uh, especially in a city that calls itself Nashua, I think um, shows that we at least care and we are open to change. So thank you. Okay, Alderman Lopez. Well, first, as a Lopez, I'd like to point out to anybody who's focusing on this as an Italian heritage thing that uh, Mr. Columbus did get some funding from the Spanish court. Not that we're super proud of the results, but um, it's worth mentioning. Um, the initial um, reaction I had to this was it's great because Columbus Day um, particularly is a very much an antiquated um, holiday and it doesn't really, it's not something that needs to be celebrated in terms of his accomplishment. He was just a business person who, you know, had a theory that ended up being proven wrong ended up in grossly the wrong part of the country versus what he aimed at. Um, but that the impetus behind it was that he was an explorer who an explorer initially, who... sorry, who initially kicked off what ultimately resulted in the colonization of the US. The colonization of Nashua particularly included a lot of tension between the settlers and the Abenaki um, and the Nashua Indians. And our history as a city does not do a very good job of of referencing that at all. Um, if anything, it sort of just glosses over um, the conflict. It, it takes a reasonable amount of effort to find out what exactly the Indian Head Massacre was about, um, where I, why all the original uh, residents of Dunstable Village are, all have death dates at approximately the same time. So while I appreciate the, um, the focus on this being an, a, uh, an indigenous um, uh, awareness day, are we doing anything as a city to connect with the Abenaki or any Indian tribes particularly to try to reclaim some of that lost heritage? That, that, that's really my concern. Um, I wanted to get a little bit more um, background from Shoshana as the author as to what prompted this. I didn't know if there was any conversation or if we would have any kind of presentation from um, those that culture or anybody representative of the tri of the regional tribes. Um, I guess so. My question is to the to Shoshana is is that all we're doing here is we're just changing the name? I'm waiting to be recognized. Alderwoman Kelly, would you like to uh, speak? Um, yes. So I mean, I think. 
characterizing this as just changing a name sort of misses the point here. And I think Alderman Clements had a good, you know, point about why we're doing this. Um, I think if I could take all the credit I would, but I had a constituent come to me and say, there are multiple cities in New Hampshire that are doing this. And I think given our heritage um, and the fact that we are a very diverse city that we should consider this. Um, and I agree wholeheartedly. I have Blackfoot Indian. Uh, my dad's grandmother was full. Um, so I think that to the point of who are we putting in sort of a celebratory role, uh, we need to shift that focus. I hear your thoughts on the connection with what happened here in Nashua, and I think that's a really solid um, opportunity for us to reach out and potentially make sure that that history is out there. Uh, but I think we have to do this first. Thank you, Alderman Kelly. Uh, anyone else from the committee that has Alderman a Lopez has his hand up. Yeah, again. my hand was up. I was uh, asking that hey, question Alderman for clarification. Lopez. Um, so based on the response, I, I'm in favor of uh, moving forward with this, um, but I wonder if there's an opportunity, especially since the mayor was attending this meeting, like he's missing, um, to add language in that we would welcome some sort of celebration or input from the indigenous community um, or representatives of it. So that, because I take uh, Alderman Kelly's point that we have to start somewhere, we have to at least change the name, um, but I wanna make sure this doesn't end up being performative justice and I wanna do more than change the name if possible, because we are in the middle of, of creating an, uh, a resolution. So if we could add some sort of invitation or um, at least a, an indication that we're committed to better researching our own city his history and how that's presented, um, those would be just my recommendations. I guess if the mayor isn't here, then I can just ask him to refine his proclamation. Alderman Karen, Alderman. If, uh, yeah, if I could re re reply. Yeah, okay. Alderman Kelly. Uh, as I said before, Alderman Lopez, I'm totally open to working with you or the mayor um, to refine that. I think it's a really important piece of this. Okay, well, I, like I said, there's nothing that I can amend right now or propose um, in order to codify it because <laughs> I don't have the mayor here. Um, but it's, like I said, this is an opportunity. So maybe that's something we could look at in terms of how as a city we, we present it, uh, you know, next Monday. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to make comments? Concerning Alderman this, Dowd has his uh, hand up. Alderman Dowd. Yes, um, I agree with everything that's been said and I have no problem with um, the, the action that's being addressed, however, I wish that it was being done at the state or federal level. Um, my only concern, minors it might be, is that we're gonna have towns all over the country naming the holiday a different term or, and and, and I guess the other thing is, I, I'm not sure if any contracts call for having Columbus Day off, which would require a change to a contract, but uh, those are my only concerns. Thank you, Alderman Dowd. Is there anyone else? Alderman Clay has her hand up, and then I'd like to reply to Alderman Dowd. Okay. Ald Alderman Clay? Uh, yes, I just wanted to add, as a state rep, we have brought this up in, in the state house. Um, and I believe this year it had actually um, passed. The problem was that with the pandemic, all those bills got killed. Um, so I, I I do think with the right um, people up in Concord, it will pass um, most likely on a um, on on a a state level. But I can't uh, you know I can't attest to that definitely. Thank you, Alderwoman Kelly. Thank you, and thank you, Adeline Clay, for that update on the state. I'd love to see that happen at the state level as well. Um, I think to the point uh, that was made about people changing it. It's kind of slow incremental change. I know Dover has changed it, Keene has changed it, and we're sort of creating that 
to then hopefully get it to the state and federal level. So I hope we'll continue to lead. Okay. Anyone else have a comment? Um, okay, so I would like to speak. So with these questions, Alderwoman Kelly from Alderman Lopez, um, would you like to refine this or add to this resolution um, some of the ideas that he has presented? Um, and if so, would you consider tabling this and this wouldn't go into effect until next year anyway? I don't okay. think that it needs to be tabled because we have the right to amend at any point. Um, and particularly- no, I was I was going to say sorry. the same thing, <laughs> literally um, what I was going to say. <laughs> and I, I would also okay. point out that there is still some symbol symbolism in being able to pass it on time. So I see the opportunity, but I'm, I mean, I got a year to work on it. Oh, it took Columbus a while to get here, so figure it out. <laughs> okay. Alderman, Alderman Clemens. Yeah. No, I'm good. Alderman Clemens has his hand up again. Friend okay. Up. Alderman Clemens. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I was wondering, um, so our calendar uh, is uh, the, well, Columbus Day is next Monday, um, and it would be nice to change it ahead of time. I don't know, you know, if it's possible if um, the president is on, I know, if she would be amenable to adding this uh, to the agenda, or if that's even possible, um, if we were to move this forward tonight to tomorrow's meeting, uh, we have a special board of aldermen meeting and try to get it done uh, tomorrow so that we could have it done in time. I don't know if that's uh, if, if that's even possible, though, but um, it would be nice if we could. Alderman Karen? Yes, Alderman Wilshire, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I don't oppose this legislation, but I think it's really short notice um, to put it on the agenda. I think a lot of people will think it's a big deal and that we just moved it along quickly. I think people might have a problem with it. But, and I think it's too short notice to put it on the agenda for tomorrow night. Right. Can I, may I continue? Alderman Clemens yes, has his Alderman. hand up and then Alderman Clee. Okay. Thank you. I, I appreciate. Clemens. Thank you. I appreciate that, uh, President Wilshire. That that you know, it's it's too short of a notice, and I and I and I I get that. Um. Uh. But you know, I I I would agree with um the previous speakers that there's no need to um amend this. I I think it should move forward, and um we should um we should pass this as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay. Alderwoman Clee, would you like to speak first? Yes, I, I, I would, thank you. Um, I I think that it, it's a good thing for the, the board to discuss this and, and vote on it and so on. Um, I will be honest, I've gotten a lot of negative feedback. I think if it were out there long enough, we would probably hear equally from both sides. Um, so to one of the things I keep getting people say, as Nash was making such an important decision as to name a holiday that is considered a federal holiday and so on, they would like it on um, on a ballot. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that it's a decision that the board can can make and so on. But I think if what Alder, um, Alderwoman President Wilshire had mentioned, if we push this to tomorrow's meeting, it's going to give the appearance that we're trying to rush it through to get it through without hearing the voice of the people. And I really would like to hear from um, from the people. And I think it will give those that are definitely for it the opportunity to come out and speak more um, because it'll be out there and it'll be heard. So um, just my opinion, I'm not a member, but I, I, I think uh, waiting is a bad thing, but I do respect what Alder, Alderman Clement said about we're coming up on Columbus Day. So it would have been a nice gesture to, to move it forward. But I think we do need to give the people time. Alderman Lopez has his hand up. Okay, well, uh, Alderman Kelly, would you like to speak first and then Alderman Lopez? No, you can go to Alderman Lopez. You sure? Okay, Alderman Lopez. Oh, great, okay, well. <laughs> um, so uh, I concur with much of what um, Alderman Clemens and what Alderman Clee said. Um, 
I don't think anybody has a crystal ball and can automatically, you know, anticipate this. So first I applaud Alderman Kelly for being the one who actually stepped forward and brought it up, uh, regardless of whether it was a little too close to the um, Columbus Day weekend or not. Um, I don't think we anything we do here is necessarily has bearing on um, national holidays. And I think we're acting well within our rights to name a holiday in our city. Um, but I also agree that there are going to be people who want to be heard, and I want to hear from them too, because I want to see exactly how they frame their argument and um, what their positions are. So I appreciate the Alderman Clement's enthusiasm to moving fo for moving forward. Um, I think that we get the best of both worlds by passing this legislation the way that we're doing it, um, but then by giving us time to continue to create it. Because when we do craft something to amend to it, to make it a little bit more than just a name change, um, people can object to that if they want to. Um, so I think we give the opportunity to the public to uh, debate the issue or the topic. Um, in the context of what the change that we would be making, we would also likely be able to actually inform the public in general through that dialogue as to some of the history of Nashua. So I kind of think it's a win-win here where we can pass it today for next year. We can demonstrate that we are attuned enough to um, public opinion to at least recognize the need for this, while at the same time, we get the opportunity to entertain people who have differing opinions uh, at a different time over the year. Thank you. Anyone else? I would like to speak. All right, all the woman Kelly. Um, so thank you for everyone's, you know, thoughts on this. I think it's been a good discussion. I appreciate the enthusiasm of Alderman Clemens as well, but I think I've also been the cheerleader for doing things in the right order at the right time. Um, and I think there are people who want to be heard on this and we don't need to, to rush it through. I think pushing it here from this committee says how we feel and we can hear from everybody else. Um, doesn't keep us from trying to get into the history as um, Alderman Lopez said. Uh, really look forward to you know finding some of that history and connecting with the community in that way. So um, I will stop talking. Okay, any other discussion? Okay, would the clerk please call the roll? I, uh, yes. Alderman Karen. Yes. Alderman Clements. Yes. Alderman Lopez. Yes. Alderman Kelly is a yes, and Alderman Cleaver. Yes, it's well past time, thank you. That is five okay. days and zero nays. Okay, motion carried. New business ordinances. Uh, before us, we have O2031, prohibiting dogs and fenced in tot lots. I will move to recommend final passage by roll call. And I believe okay, Alderwoman Clee would like to speak to this. Okay, you've heard the motion. So uh, Alderman. Woman Clee, you're the sponsor of this. Would you please speak towards your? Uh, yeah, yes, I, I was going to do a bark, but I thought that was really not, not appropriate. So. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you did say speak, and I, I you know, two dogs is yeah. what I do. So, anyway. Not any um, weirder than anything I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. You've set that bar high, so, <laughs> or low, I'm not sure which. But, um, the, the truth is the way that this um, ordinance came about was I was um, contacted by a um, constituent um, about the, sh originally about the um, Shattuck tot lot. Um, he had brought his children there and there were um, many animal feces there. And a number of times he went to go to in there and there were people that had one or two dogs that were just running around freely in it. So he, he decided to go to another Hot lot. And as he did, he ran across similar situation. So I contacted um, uh, Mr. Caggiano from Parks and Rec, and I, I told him that I wanted to kind of put this through and, and I wanted some input from him. He had told me, and I, my original plan was all hot lots. Um, 
he spoke to me and said that that really wasn't practical because some of the tot lots weren't fenced in. So it would mean that even people that had leash dogs couldn't walk through the area. Um, it would be hard to um, control. And, and truth be told, the thing that I had really asked for was just to have signage put up, no dogs allowed. But as the signage requires an ordinance, um, that's where we, where we come to. Um, so that was the whole thing. And, and as you can tell, there's only um, a, a small number of hot lots that, um, that actually are fenced in. So that's why I put those particular ones in there. Um, this has gone to the, um, the Animal Advisory Committee and they've made um, a couple of brilliant suggestions. Um, and, and I would like um, if, if Alderman Lopez would be so kind as to, to amend this to include the following changes. One meaning, one would say to prohibiting dogs in, in fenced in tot lots is the current name of it. It would be prohibiting pets in fenced in tot lots. The other language change would be to um, say to um, add language excluding service animals as defined under the ADA from the prohibition of it. And, and that makes perfect sense. And the third uh, that they requested, and I agree fully with this, is to add language to include not only the listed fenced in tot lots, but also future fenced in tot lots. So that as we add more tot lots that are fenced in, that they will be included and that not just the named ones. I'm not sure if that would be appropriate or if we would have to make amendments as those come through, but um, I do think it's it's good language to, to put in there. Um, I have no issues at all with those changes. I, I'm glad that they, they caught it. Um, I think that they're really good suggestions and ideas and, um, um, and, and I, I think the original thought from my constituent was that um, not to allow the dogs to run free in there. I don't believe that, and I've had three that have contacted me in this. I don't believe that they felt a dog on a leash would be an issue, but the truth be told, um, dogs on leashes still poop. And I'm sorry to say that not everybody picks it up. And for the health of our children, everyone knows I'm a dog lover. I'm obsessed with my dog. Um, but I think it's probably a good idea just to exclude them from these few areas. I, I don't think it's a hardship for a dog owner. Um, and if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, do we have any questions or concerns from members of the committee first? Alderman Lopez, Alderman Clemens have their hands up. I was gonna let Alderman okay. Clemens. Alderman uh start because i was asked to do the motion okay alderman clement no i'll, I'll defer to you uh alderman uh oh, no no after you okay um <laughs> so just to add some context from the discussions that were brought up um okay. if that's okay with the chair yes that's fine okay um the no the changing it to no pets was they were cons i mean first of all there's an opportunity here because if you change it if you're going to start um, addressing issues in there. There's other pets that could really be an issue. Um, someone someone mentioned someone deciding to bring their pet bowl into a tot lot, which is just not a good idea. Um, and then other things like chickens or pot-bellied pigs have been identified as pets by people. So people might see an area that's fenced in, think, oh, I can let my thing loose. And that's not what that area is for. Um, so that was uh, a lot of the idea behind that. Um, the um, changing the the language to include service animals specifically um, and make sure that that's excluded in the way. They wanted to leave that up to legal, which I think is a wise idea as well. So I don't know that I would be uh, sponsoring specific language in an amendment, just maybe suggesting a general change. Um, and because of the way the, the uh, committees are, are designed, that the Animal Park Advisory Board is obviously just an advisory committee, but I would, we wanted to make sure that we didn't make a motion and, and advance with it after they had given their advice if that advice hadn't gone to the sponsor. So I'm glad that Alderman Clee uh, got a chance to see those um, changes um, for members of the board that were a little um, taken aback that it wasn't forwarded to them. It looks like there was literally just a clerical misunderstanding where the initial um, notes were sent out this morning um, as a memo and they were addressed to the Board of Aldermen, but they were sent to our assistant instead of using the actual Board of Alderman email. So 
if this had been any other situation and there'd been more than like a weekend and a morning to, to get this done, then I think we would have all seen this before the committee. But um, I think they're just making suggestions that as a committee, we can enact here. Uh, Madam Hensley. Chair, th thank you very much. Um, Madam Chair, if, if I may um, add, I, I do want to comment on that, um, that this committee did meet on this past Friday and they did take it up at that time. Um, I was unable to attend that meeting. Um, so in, in all fairness to them, they did try to get it to us as quickly as possible. So I, I hope we don't hold that against them that it, it wasn't here on time. Um, and, and I think after reading this memo, it, it's really truly a paragraph of just those three items that I that I mentioned. And I and I think that uh, they've done their due diligence and um, they tried to get it to us as quickly as possible. It was just a little snafu, and I and I don't think it's truly anything of a major. Are you all done, Alderman Cleef? You cut out, I think. Oh yeah, she froze. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. I can see. Okay, I can see you guys. You're all moving and talking. But um, anyway, so I said, you know, whatever the, the board decides is obviously you're, it's up to, to you to make that decision. But I hope that this would not um, slow this down just because we didn't get the memo in time. I think it was an, an honest snafu. Alderman Clemens. Uh, thank you. I'd be happy to uh, make the amendments that uh, were suggested um, officially. Um, so, and what we can do is um, have uh, Corporation Council put this in the correct lawyer language, if you will, but I would um, move to amend uh, to add the following um, to the uh, ordinance, and that would be, number one, prohibit pets uh in fenced in pot lots to change the name of the um ordinance to that and instead of referencing dogs we would represent i'm sorry we would reference pets um number two exclude from this uh service animals uh and number three uh provide that any future pot lots that are fenced in will be included in this ordinance uh, that would be my motion the motion by Alderman Clemens is to have those things put into lawyer, lawyerly language. <laughs> is there any discussion on the motion? Jim, do we still have you? Okay. All right. So you all um, understand the amended motion. Is there any other questions or concerns? Okay, then we'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Alderman Karen. Yes. Alderman Lopez. Yes. Ruff. <laughs> Alderman <laughs> Clemens. Yes. <laughs> See how the transcriber does that. <laughs> Other one probably is a yes, not a wolf. And I hope that wolf gets in. <laughs> Other one, Cleaver. <laughs> I'm a yes, thank you. You have five yes and zero nays. Okay. Motion is carried. Thank you, everyone. You're all good puppy. Okay. Next ordinance. Um, Madam Chair. Yeah, we, we we that was the motion to amend. We do need to I'm recognize so, the final passage. I'm sorry, you're right, need, Alderman Clemping. <laughs> I move to recommend final passage um, as amended. Okay, you heard the motion. Any comments, concerns? Okay, will the clerk please call the roll? I have too many tabs open. Sorry. <laughs> Alderman Karen. Yes. Alderman Clements. Yes. Alderman Lopez. Yes. Alderman Kelly is a yes. Alderman Cleaver. Yes. We have five yeas and zero nays. 
Okay, motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Clee. Okay, next ordinance. Uh, we have before us O2032, reducing the fine for overnight parking violations. Uh, I will move to recommend final passage by roll call. Okay, you heard the motion, and my understanding is Alderman Laws is here. Sure am. Okay, would you like to speak on it before um, <laughs> I tell you about my phone call? Thank you. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Put you. you on the spot, Alderman Laws. I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, uh, I have two primary objections to the current overnight parking um, fine. First and foremost is a matter of equity in that it disproportionately affects people who live downtown, which are disproportionately lower income residents. And the parking ticket is $25 and goes up to $35, whereas most every other parking violation is a $10 ticket. So <clears throat> the people who, you know, aren't owning property in Nashua and are renting downtown typically make less income and have to pay more money. A lot of them are renting from uh, landlords who don't provide parking at all whatsoever which would, you would think would be more of a, an impetus on the landlord to provide parking for their tenants and not something that burdens the tenants. That being said, my other objection to it is that as you all know, I am a uh, lifelong bartender or a career long bartender anyway. And I know from first and experience with patrons from my bar and other bars and countless stories that the $25 fine is a deterrent for people to leave their cars downtown if they've had too much to drink. And I mean, that in, in, in is enough for me. I mean, not encouraging people to drive drunk, uh, I think is enough to get rid of it altogether. But I understand the need to have the fine. And if, you know, $10 is enough to deter them from parking overnight, then $25 is two and a half times that. Um, I lost my thought there. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. Um, <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. So I'd, I'd, I'd be I'd very interested to hear what the members of the committee have to say about it. And I, I very much want to hear about your phone call. I'm, if I may, <laughs> I'm assuming that you will. I, I'm assuming that has something to do with the uh, economic development suggesting that this would cripple, effectively cripple the overnight parking program where they're hiring people to go around and give tickets, which is certainly not my intention. I mean, this is really just a matter of protecting that my constituents have come to me and that this has been a real financial burden for them. And then people who might potentially be driving drunk and not drunk, not have the, the judgment to say, you know, it's better to take an Uber than to get a $25 ticket. <clears throat> but that's, that's, that's my so far. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Laws. Does anyone from the committee have any questions or concerns um, concerning this ordinance? I see Alderman Clemens and Alderman Lopez, and I'll probably speak after that. Okay, Alderman Clemens. Thank you. I um I don't like the overnight parking ban. Um, I think that uh, the city would be better served without it. Um, and what I would rather see is a parking program put into place that we have in the tree streets and in French Hill right now and see that expanded to any um, Nashua resident who wants it. Um, and to supplement the ticket revenue, I'd rather see that, um, you know, make it make the, in other words, make the make it a thing that you have to buy for the year um, and we can get rid of the fines altogether unless you don't have a, a pass, you know what I mean? Um, but as far as lowering this, um, I understand the, the, we received a memo this evening from Jill Stansfield about the uh, park, the committee members did about the park 
uh, parking or I'm sorry, ticket revenue um, and what it goes to fund. And I'm sensitive to those needs as well. Um, so, but I, I, I agree 100% with Alderman Laws and, and the rationale behind this as well. We need to strike a balance and we shouldn't be doing it on the backs of people that are making a responsible decision not to uh, drive impaired or making, um, you know, they happen to live in a place that unfortunately their landlord doesn't provide them uh, with parking and they risk the ticket uh, every night. So I, I, I do understand that as well. Um, so we, we have to be able to strike a balance. I'm not 100% there on this legislation yet because I do what I would like to hear from is I would like the I would like the economic development director to come to this meeting uh, and discuss this along with um, Jill Stansfield as well. Um, and really so that we can get more of a grasp of the numbers and what the details are. Um, because while I appreciate the memo that came out, it came out, you know, an hour before this committee meeting. And I don't think that that is appropriate. So um, with all that said, I would, um, I, I, you know, my recommendation would be that the committee uh, at least hold it until the, they can come in and, and discuss with us exactly what the uh, the details are. But thank you. Okay. Um, Alderman Lopez and then Alderman Kelly. Um, yeah, I think Alderman um, Clemens makes a very good point about this being a very much an 11th hour um, memo and out of deference to the conversation we just had about making sure that uh, committees are informed or have enough time to actually process this kind of stuff. I think it is important to give that kind of time frame. So I would be open to uh, tabling uh, if the sponsor, uh, Alderman Laws, is open to it. I will say that uh, whether we table it or whether we are voting on it tonight, I'm going to support it because, as was also observed, I'm one of two ward aldermen whose residents are subject to this pretty regularly versus other ward aldermen or at-large aldermen that might represent constituents who choose to park in certain areas because they are visiting or um, are engaging in recreational activity. So on behalf of the residents who live downtown and get nailed uh, with parking tickets, I, I have, I feel no choice but to support this moving forward. I recognize that it's problematic. Uh, I think Alderman uh, Clemens's idea about creating a downtown parking program is very interesting. Um, I think maybe focusing it on specific areas like the parking garage um, might also be interesting, but I have not seen a will on the part of economic development to engage in that in a, a manner other than raising prices and making it more difficult um, to for people with lower economic means to park. I think that is perceived as a revenue generator. Um, and while as aldermen, we have to be careful not to put ourselves in the red and make sure that we can actually pay the guy to go out and ticket. Um, that's an important part. We also very rarely get an opportunity to lower taxes, and I think this is a tax. Um, so while there is a need for regulation and there is a need for balancing the books, um, I think specifically because of the constituents I represent, I am going to be support this in whatever form it moves forward if possible. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Alderwoman Kelly. Um, I'm going to defer to Alderman Klee because I think she wants to talk about her constituency who is also affected by this and then, I, and then I will speak. Okay, so before Alderman, since um, Alderman Klee is not a member of the committee, um, I'd like to speak first and this might give the committee some thought to um, what has been suggested about tabling. Um, and I agree with the Alderman that um, a last minute memo um, was really, you know, kind of makes it kind of hard for the committee to look at. Um, I feel that um, someone from parking or economic development should have been here. But the phone call I did receive was from Jill Stanfield and they're recommending that this be tabled only because, as you know, parking enforcement was supposed to be putting together 
a report concerning all the parking within the city. And unfortunately, with everything that's happened since March, that hasn't taken place. But they are working to get it started at the beginning of the year. And they would rather not have new legislation coming in for parking until this report is finalized and presented to the Board of Aldermen. Because if there are things in there that we have to come back and change some of these new ordinances, going to make it a little bit more complicated. And we are paying to have this study done. So um, my feeling um, is that we should table this uh, to time certain. I, and I, I understand everyone's um, concern, the cost, but we also have to look at the other thing. We are not a city of overnight parking, except in those designated areas um, that you have to have a permit. So we have to uh, look at it in both ways. So with that being said, um, Alderwoman Clee, if you'd like to speak, um, go ahead. Thank you so much. I appreciate, and not being a member, I appreciate you giving me the time. Um, That's okay. I, 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 I have very mixed emotions, I think much like um, what uh, Alderman Lopez uh, feels about this. Um, it it affects actually more than just the, the low income um, residents of, of my ward in the French Hill area. It affects um, throughout ward, ward three. Um, in this particular case, lowering the fee does not kill the overnight parking program. It still maintains it. It's just bringing the fee in line with what the other parking um, fees are. Um, so I, I see to that, I see that point. Um, so at first I thought, why are we doing this? We've got that master plan kind of going through as far as the parking is concerned. And then I realized that this just changed the fee structure. It didn't change the overnight parking as to where and, and so on. It didn't do that. So I, I didn't feel that one affected the other. Um, but I, I, I'm not disagreeing with you guys tabling it. I, I think that's probably a good idea to get all parties in to speak to it. Um, I, I don't have a solution to this. Um, I think we do need an overnight program. I would also suggest if it would be okay for when you do bring this back up that you possibly bring in um, uh, um, Chief Rhodes because one of the things um, that when I had spoken to um, the, the Nashua fire um, was one of the issues that came up was that at nighttime, two o'clock in the morning or something like that. If their car is parked and they can't get to a house with, with, um, with fire and rescue, meaning they can't get an ambulance in there, a lot of times the car that's parked in front of that house illegally doesn't necessarily belong to that house. And that means trying to get the people out and so on. I would just kind of like to hear what they have to say about some of our narrow streets. Um, and then, you know, to that, I, I just think just getting their, their, their opinion on it. Um, as far as the overnight parking, not as far as the fees concerned. This again has nothing to do, you're not killing the program. You're just changing the fee structure in this one. Um, but when you do decide to move forward as to whether or not to keep the overnight program, I really do think that it would be nice to have um, fire and rescue their opinion in, in the whole thing. So thank you for allowing me to speak. You're welcome. Anyone else? Me. Alderwoman Kelly? Yeah, thank you. You so I want <laughs> I want to thank Alderman Laws for bringing this forward and for laying out pretty succinctly um, how this affects uh, lower income people in our city. Uh, I think the argument that just bringing it in line with other fees makes complete sense. The piece that I want I I won't I won't support tabling it. I think we have consistently use this parking study as a reason to not talk about anything parking related for over two years. And I think we need to, I appreciate that there's gonna be an overall plan at some point, I think that's great, uh, but we also have to deal with the business that's in front of us and stop deferring it because this parking study is gonna happen at some point at some time. Uh, like we've said before, we have the ability to change ordinances that we write um, 
pretty easily. So I'm going to support this for all of the points uh, that were brought forward by Alderman Laws and there are about five other people who would like to speak now. Okay. We have members of the committee, members of the committee first. Sure, Alderman Cleaver. Yes, thank you very much. I think it's time to move forward on this. I object to the idea of tabling. I think all the reasons are very clear that we need to get this uh, reduced for all the reasons that Brandon has pointed out and uh, and others. I think it's it's a, a burden that needs to be lifted. And I, I agree that uh, it is a reduction in revenues uh, just by, by sheer mathematics, but it doesn't kill the program. And I'm sure that we can make up for it in other ways without burdening our, our citizens. I'd like to move forward and get this done down to $10. Alderman Clemens has his hand up and then Alderman okay, Dad and Alderman Laz Clemens. would like to speak. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. I, um, I, I agree 100% with not tabling this because of the parking study. Um, I think that the excuse for some of the things that we haven't done or that have been tabled um, because of the parking study get to be on some level ridiculous. However, I do think that a good reason to table this would be uh, the fact that we're losing $250,000 and somebody's job might be in jeopardy. Uh, and that's what I'm concerned about because I wanna make sure that, you know, if this is something that we are going to do, uh, that we have a funding plan in place to make sure that that person has a job with the city and can continue on uh, doing that. And if that means, you know, if the difference is, you know, reducing it, I think the ordinance is 10 and, you know, to 15 to be able to make that up so that somebody can keep their job and that we can keep revenue to a better degree in the city, I, I would be in support of something like that. Um, so I think I, for me, uh, I'm not going to support it going forward at this point because I need more information from the uh, economic development director. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alderman Clement. Alderwoman Kelly. Yep, we have Alderman Dowd, Alderman Laws, and Alderman Lopez. Okay, Alderman Lopez, I'll go go first, and then Alderman Laws, and then Alderman Dowd. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so my not so hit secret history of of trying to change parking downtown is is a matter of record on the infrastructure committee, and I would just caution the uh, committee that the economic development department does its job, which is to advance its agendas and its objectives and do and manage the city in the way that it it sees as best. Some of those ideas are. Um, a little bit more uh, philosophical than uh, than are necessary for Nashua, in my opinion. Um, I think they may be based on best practices, quote, uh, that are taking place in larger cities. Um, so it's been my experience that as aldermen, we have to do our job. We have to vet these issues uh, because if we allow for an indefinite um, tabling or some sort of Let's table until we get a study done. What I've I've personally seen happening is the scope of studies continually be expanded, the desires and interests, you know, what might be a traffic flow study turns into a parking study. The definition of downtown gets expanded to, you know, river to river. Uh, I've I've literally seen that over the last couple of years at the uh, infrastructure committee, or I've seen complete radio silence. There was at least two years where you couldn't get anything proposed or on the or any discussion even to be had. So this is a conversation that's long overdue, but additionally, the time for pure conversation is over. Like there's definitely a need for action. There's definitely a need to support our constituents. And I think that while I'm sensitive to the needs of a, a city staff member, I'm also sensitive to the needs of the constituents who $25 is a big deal in the middle of a pandemic where you don't have a lot to, to, to spend. And it's not just people who might be drinking a little more than is a good idea to drive home that are getting caught with uh, overnight parking fees, and might be people who are having other issues too. 
Um, and while the city does try to be somewhat um, reasonable with how it, it addresses these, I think this is definitely an area that we need to take action on. Um, so I'm not in favor at all of waiting for the parking study, which was, I believe, when we started this, and Alderman Clemens might be able to, or Shoshana Kelly might be able to refresh my memory, memory, but I believe I started pushing on parking somewhere around the summer of 2018 and was convinced, you know, to wait until we presented, uh, we had a full conversation about um, on-street overnight parking and downtown parking and all that kind of stuff. And then in 2019, I had a number of bills that were just left on the table because we were waiting for the parking study, which was supposedly going to be initiated in the summer and then the fall and then the spring and then COVID-19 hit. So I think if you make a problem so big that you can never find a solution, there's always going to be a reason why you can't do anything. Uh, and frankly, if, in working with people who experience depression, that's kind of the same thing that I see where a molehill turns into a mountain and a person just never gets out of bed because there's too many what ifs and too many maybes. And we can't do that in terms of uh, legislating and in terms of addressing needs in the Nashua community. We can't just make a problem so big that we do nothing about it. If we make a misstep, we can correct it. Um, we could also, as Alderman Clemens said, modify the legislation so that we pilot the program and say, all right, well, let's see what this looks like over the week, over the winter and, and maybe the holiday season and at least see what the real impacts of this will be. And that would also give us some ideas for some other alternatives because as uh, Alderman Clements pointed out, there's an opportunity for a specific downtown parking program to be implemented. I would love to see some kind of permitting or license fee tax applied to tow trucks operating downtown because I think a couple of them are being a little bit opportunistic and making a killing off of basically our citizens' misery, and they're taxing a lot more than we are. So um, I think there's other areas that we could be looking at this dynamic rather than making it a choice between individual constituent who doesn't have any money and city that needs to maintain a program for safety's sake. Um, I think we should, we should look at this, definitely have a larger conversation, but I don't think that conversation will take place if we don't take any action. Okay, Alderman Laws. Thank you. Uh, I mean, everyone's pretty much touched on the, the points I was gonna make, but if I just, can just add a little context here, this isn't something that just came to me in a dream three weeks ago. Uh, I've been dealing with this for I mean, much longer than I've been an alderman. I mean, I've been working downtown late at night for literally the last 20 years. So I've been dealing with this a lot when it comes to at least the, uh, the the encouraging people not to leave their cars downtown after they've been drinking part that being said none of those people are the ones that have reached out to me it's all been constituents who live downtown don't make a ton of money and are getting popped with 25 dollars parking tickets because you know for one reason or another i mean and it, i'm not gonna you know bog you down with all the details but there are varying reasons and there are varying levels of of, of accountability for these residents. I mean, some of them, it, no fault of their own, and it's uh, like the, the fault of the city. That being said, uh, three weeks ago, I was driving to Milford to pick up a cord of wood. And the only reason I bring that up is because I remember specifically what I was doing when I was having this conversation with Director Cummings. And so they've had three weeks to prepare for this meeting and to come in here and give you guys an argument for why they should why you should table this or why this shouldn't go forward. And I think the fact that, and this is not, I mean, no disrespect to Director Cummings or, or Jill Stanfield, I think they're great and they do wonderful work for the city. But I think the fact that they are not here and their presence is not known at this meeting tells you everything you need to know about how important it is for them to not have this go forward. Uh, furthermore, as, I, as a few of my colleagues have pointed out, I mean, this is a conversation that needs to it not, not just happen, but continue to happen. That our parking situation in Ashua is antiquated. It, it doesn't make a lot of sense in a lot of different areas. And I feel like people have these, these tired tropes about, you know, we have to worry about the 911 thing. We have to worry about the narrow streets. And yeah, that's great. I, I don't disagree with any of those things. But the fact that we just keep tabling these parking discussions until later, it, all it does is support what Alderman Lopez was saying. That, and we just end up never having the conversation at all. And uh, I, I would 
highly recommend that my colleagues on this committee uh, reconsider if they were thinking about tabling this until later. I think that we need to push this forward on behalf of our constituents and on behalf of this conversation that needs to happen. So uh, thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Alderman Dowd. Alderman Cleaver yes. also has his hand up. Yes. Um, I, well, I don't disagree with the things that have been mentioned in as uh, generating this motion. Uh, uh, I will say this chair of budget that I disagree with the previous speaker that the fines are a fee, not a tax. And this is not reducing tax. If we reduce our revenues by $250,000, that will be a tax because there's only, we're very, very tight budgets going forward. And the reduction that we, that we found with some of the accounts where we had a heck of a time trying to add less than 100,000 to an account, 250,000 is going to do one of two things. It's going to increase the tax rate or it's going to cut services. So unless we find another alternative for this revenue, I will not support this. Thank you, Alderman Dowd. Alderman Cleaver? Yes, thank you very much. I, uh, just to address that point, my understanding is that 250,000 is total parking revenue uh, fee, fees. Uh, so would be 100,000 would still be there. So we wouldn't lose the whole 250,000. That's first of all. Second of all, I think it's a lot to be said to be bring the parking fee in, in line with every other fine we have associated with with automobile operation and parking in the in the downtown. And uh, I, I disagree very strongly with trying to table this. I think we have it reversed. I think if we eventually get the parking study and they recommend that higher fees are needed, then I would address it then. But $10 is, is the fee that we should be charging right now. Anyone else? Alderman Clemens, Alderman Wilshire. Okay, Alderman Wilshire, since you haven't spoken, I'll let you speak first and then Alderman Clemens. Thank you. I, I agree with Alderman Dowd. I won't be supporting this when it comes to the full board. I think um, you know we don't we don't push this in the in city departments' faces because they haven't done anything for us on this. I understand that there's some frustration that this hasn't gone forward. As I'm a little frustrated with it too, but we had planned to start this in the spring, and you know seven months later here we are. So I, I don't think it's the right way to go. I do think there are areas we can we can work on that need overnight parking, but just to say, you know, people that are out drinking want to leave their cars and it's safer. Well, if they have the money to go out and drink, maybe they can take an Uber home or, or a Lyft and, you know, and not, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not going to support this. And I, I have concerns about the budget hit we'll take with it. It'll pr probably put one or two people, maybe even three people out of a job. If those are things we have to discuss with the department before we pass this, and do you really want to send it to the full board with a positive recommendation before you talk to them? And that's okay. We'll have the discussion there, which really isn't where it should happen. So I, I would suggest if I were on the committee, I would vote to table, but I'm not. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alderman Clement. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I I agree with uh, Alderman Wilshire and Alderman Dowd um, to a degree. Um, I think that um, you know I, I I'm I, I agree with some of I agree with the fact that I think that this needs to be um, put on hold here in the committee um, and you know have Director Cummings come in, have Jill Stanfield come in. Uh, and talk about it. I'm very sensitive to the fact of what, uh, however, Alderman Laws said in that the fact that they're not here does speak volumes. And, you know, um, I, 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 I get that sentiment because I'm frustrated with it too. 
because there's been things that I've been working on that that I've you know had to push and, and pull and and I still don't have answers and, and things like that. So not my favorite um, department in the city, I can tell you that. That being said, there are hardworking people that do work in that department. And I am very concerned that a $250,000 cut could mean uh, their, their jobs. Um, the fiscal note on the back of the legislation says, and I will read it, um, a 60% reduction in the overnight parking violation fine amount would result in an approximate loss in annual enforcement revenue of between 225,000 and 250,000. So that's 250 or 225 to 250,000 a year approximately that they're estimating that we're going to lose and that's on the legislation itself. Um, so yeah, it it it's concerning and and one of the things that I would like to know is is there some kind of middle ground here? Is there a way that we can go in between 25 and 10 and make that number work? Or what, you know, I want, to, I, I want more answers. And it's frustrating as all heck to me that we don't have the people here tonight uh, that we should have. And we got a memo an hour before. And, you know, I could put blame. I've already put the blame where, where it needs to be, but as policymakers, we need to look at those things and we need to look at the decisions that we make are going to affect people. Um, and in particular, they're going to affect the, the parking enforcement people. And I, I just can't move forward with something that I don't have an answer to what it's going to do to those people's livelihoods. And quite frankly, a lot of the, the maintenance to the garages and things like that, how are we gonna make up the revenue? So, you know, it's not, for me, for me personally, it's not about the parking study. For me personally, it's not about the, um, the lack of communication that we've been receiving from the department. For me, it's about the fundamentals and what we are looking to do. And, um, so for me, I can't support it moving forward. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Okay, so can you hear me? Yes, there's two more people, June. Okay. Alderman Lopez uh, and Alderman Clea have their hands up. Okay, Alderman Lopez and then Alderman Clea. Um, so in listening to the points that are being discussed, um, I just, I, I agree with what Alderman, uh, Clemens just said that it's not about the per parking study. For me, it was parking downtime was never about the parking study. That was where the city departments moved the debate to and then didn't deliver. And that is a discussion that was overseen and chaired against my objection for at least two years, um, dating back probably further than that too. So I appreciate all of the understanding that some of the other aldermen um, have, have expressed here, but I don't think thoughts and prayers are very effective. I think if you were elected specifically to represent people and drive policy and you are empowered with that ability to do it and you aren't doing that, then your, your understanding is not borne out by your actions. So I look forward to seeing any kind of initiatives, effort, momentum, legislation sponsored, any kind of steps at all, at all from any of the aldermen who are expressing this solidarity with the people of Nashua. Um, I do think that when it comes to $250,000, we seem to be able to find it when we want it, like whether it's gonna be for subsidizing a, a riverfront property or um, numerous, numerous feasibility studies. Um, it, it's not like the money doesn't exist anywhere. Um, despite the fact that $250,000 is the upper limit, that's the only number that's gonna be quoted. I can anticipate that already. Um, so if aldermen are already committing themselves to, if I don't get my way, then I won't do anything. I'll, I'll let a disaster unfold and people will suffer. That's very unfortunate. I think it'd be more effective to work cooperatively and in working cooperatively, that doesn't just mean asking one position to concede. It also means 
offering something a little bit more tangible. I do think it would be an opportunity for uh, economic development to come and present. I think they had plenty of opportunity to do that, but um, I also think that the discussion here may show them that it's more important for them to do so. Um, I don't know the implications of one committee recommending final passage, whereas another one doesn't. And I know that the infrastructure committee isn't necessarily inclined to do that based on my own personal experience. Um, so I don't think that this is the only committee that has to take this up period for the rest of all time. In fact, I think we do need to run it through the infrastructure committee and that there would be an opportunity to present on it at that point. Um, whatever we do, if it does get to the board of aldermen, I'm sure we can handle it. I'm sure that that meeting will be chaired as fairly as any other meeting is. Um, and then we'll have the discussion as needed. Um, this is a larger problem. And I think if we continually blow it up to be an unsolvable problem, then we're giving ourselves a reason not to do anything. Okay, all the women clicked. Th thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate uh, getting a second bite at this apple. Um, first, I, I do want to echo that, um, again, this does not kill the overnight program. It just brings fees in line. But I do have a question about the fees. Um, many years before I was an alderman, I made the mistake of letting a meter um, go beyond its time at uh, over by the River Walk at Railroad Square there. Um, I received a $25 fine not a ten dollar fine for for that um and and i paid it immediately so i don't know what the fine would have been if i didn't pay it immediately but i received a 25 dollar fine for that i don't know if it's been lessened since that time um but my question is why was the fee? does anybody know why the fee was set at 25 dollars um and 35 dollars if not paid on time um at that point was it in line with what the normal parking fees were um and did something change in that? Or was this to back into an estimate of being able to pay for this program? That's my question. I'm not sure if anybody can answer that. Um, and I, I think it, listening to much of what you have to say, my other question is, is this in fact going to the infrastructure committee before Alderman Lopez had brought that up, I was going to ask that question. Or is it just here and then to the board of aldermen? And I think that's really all I had to ask. Thank you. Alderman Wilshire had her hand up. Okay, I was just going to ask if she had her hand up. Thank you, Alderman Wilshire. Thank you. Um, my concern is you, you can send this along, but we don't know how many people will lose their jobs. No one's, no one's speaking up tonight objecting to working with someone. No one has said, I'm not going to work with anyone, so don't put this legislation forward. I mean, I, I would like to to stay in your committee where it can do the most good, where you can do the most work on it, get the information you need, know how many people may or may not lose their jobs. You know, how much are the fees in the other towns? What, what's Manchester charge downtown for their parking? How much does Concord charge? I mean, I, I think at the time we did the fee structure that was very comparable, in fact, lower than some of the other towns. So I think those are all things we should be looking at and not just I don't know. And not just, you know, passing this just because we think it helps. We should have more information about how it's going to help, who it's going to help, where we can compromise. I'm okay with all of that, but I think that should be done in the committee. So I'd support that. Okay. Thank you, Alderman Wilshire. Anyone else? Alderman Kelly. Kelly. Thank you. Um, So one of the things I wanted to bring up, or I'm not sure if I want to, but we'll go there. Uh, the student parking that we put together last summer, we went around and around about quite a bit and the fiscal note for that uh, was fairly high. And I will guarantee you, and I'd love to hear the, um, the follow-up from the parking department that it did not cost the city that much. Uh, these are estimates based on worst case scenario. Um, so I just want to put that out there uh, in terms of how we consider that money. I obviously don't want anyone to lose their job. Uh, my other point is we spend a lot of time in the horseshoe, even though we're not 
we're in a virtual horseshoe right now, um, pontificating on how other people might feel about this. People will talk about, oh, well, the businesses don't want this, but the businesses aren't the people who are here. Um, if the department that this was going to affect felt very strongly about this, um, they could have been here. Um, so I, I'm still not in favor of tabling and I think we can have this discussion on the full board. It's not like it goes into effect tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so first of all, um, just to clarify, I'm just as frustrated as um, everyone else who spoke tonight because I think it's imperative when you have a piece of legislation, the person who brings it forward should be at any committee meeting to have that conversation. Any department that can be affected by a piece of legislation should have someone there to speak. And so that falls on those people who did not bother to attend, but that's another issue. The thing that I'm concerned in is that $250,000 loss. Um, yes, Alderman Lopez people, we always find a way. But right now, we've been under seven months of lockdown. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. We don't know how our taxes are going to be next year. Our budget committee is going to be really pulling strings to try to get this taken care of so that our community doesn't have to pay really high taxes because of everything that's been going on. And I agree with Alderman Wilshire. When you bring pieces of legislation, discussion should take place at the committee level. If this goes, if the committee goes to pass this and this goes to the full board in two weeks, you are going to have a lot of questions. And unfortunately, those people who should be answering the questions at the committee meeting will not be allowed to speak at the full board meeting because that's not where it should take place. It needs to take place here. I also think that the infrastructure committee should be pushing their economic development people as to the study for packing and everything else, because that's really um, their committee project. Ours at personnel is to look at fees and costs. I will not support this. I will not support this going out. I would rather, this is not, to hold this off for a month is not going to change anything one way or the other for 30 days. Uh, so, Alder Woman Karen, Alder Woman Karen, I just want to yeah. let you know Tim Tim Cummings is now on. I joined the meeting. I just want to make sure okay. you are aware. All right, let me let me okay, let me just finish. So to table it for a month, I don't think should be that big of an issue. I understand uh, tabling can be very difficult, but I'd rather see us table it and have a discussion or we're going to have major discussions at full board meeting. Now, with that being said, with Director Cummings here, um, does the committee have any problems if we have him speak on this piece of legislation? Anyone? I, I don't know. I think this is what people have been asking for, so let's talk about it. Okay. That's fine. I well, I just think it's fair to, to ask you as members of the committee about this. Uh, all the main comments. Did you have your hands up? I I did. I I since I was going to say that Director Cummings is here. Um, you know himself, but my 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 question is, would be directly to him. Uh, twofold. One uh, with the projected loss of revenue. Uh, would anybody be, would anybody's job be in jeopardy? Uh, and two, uh, the second question would be what, if not, or if so, what other things are we looking at uh, that we won't be able to do because this revenue is gone? And my third question would be, 
is there some sort of sweet spot compromise that we might be able to do to address the needs uh, that Alderman Laws brought up and where we are right now with the uh, fines? Uh, those are my three questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alderman Clement. Okay, uh, Director Cummings, uh, yeah. you've heard the questions from the committee. Uh, if you would take some time and answer those for us, that's much appreciated. Certainly, I, I, I heard uh, Alderman Clement's questions and I'll be happy to, to address those as best I could. I was not watching this meeting previously before signing on, so I do not have the luxury of having uh, any of the prior context. So if there's a specific question that arose from earlier this evening, please uh, ask it. I'll be happy to answer. I would like to take a moment, though, and just explain a little bit as to why I wasn't here. I was not aware that this was coming up this evening. Um, I was notified around 4 p.m. when a member of the Board of Aldermen had given me an indication that this piece of legislation actually was going to be hurt, uh, uh, coming up this evening. I uh, at that point in time, had already had made plans this evening, uh, so I couldn't rearrange my schedule. Uh, so that's why last minute I asked uh, Jill Stansfield to forward her memo on to you all uh, as members of the committee, so you at least had some sort of communication on um, on at least how how this piece of legislation would would affect parking. Um, with that preamble stated, I, I guess I would just comment by saying. Um, that the piece of legislation, the piece of legislation before you, um, ultimately, it really comes down to um, whether the community wants to have any type of overnight um, uh, parking enforcement. Um, parking, um, the fines are supposed to change behavior. Um, it's supposed to um, compel people to to conform in a certain way. Um, I understand that by reducing, you know, the, the reducing this uh, may make sense because some people are getting fined over and over again. Um, and I'm sympathetic to that. Um, also very sympathetic to the fact that there are certain areas of the city that get fined more than other areas. I work really hard to equalize it to make sure it's spread out throughout the entire community. Um, but ultimately, it, the, the fundamental question is, is, does the community want to have overnight on street parking, or does it does it not want to have overnight on street parking? Um, you know, this has been an underlying issue that's been floating around the board for a few years now, um, and I think this is a good conversation that should be had. But it's probably not a conversation that you know should be uh, solved all in one night. Um, so anyway, with that being said, um, specific question about whether we would uh, potentially lose any personnel. Um, from if this legislation moved forward. Um, I don't know. I would want to look at that more closely before I say yes or no to that. Um, ultimately, what this legislation would do is it would make it, um, and not that this should be a driving motivator for making these decisions. It's just something you should have as background context. Um, it will make it cost prohibitive to actually run the program as we currently do, because we would have to to keep to keep the program running, so we, um, you know, uh, have no effect on the property tax base on the property tax levy. Um, we know that we have to uh, generate a certain amount of tickets um, to to cover costs, and this runs off off book in essence, and in since it's not covered by the general fund. Um, and that's okay. And that's how we've run the program. Um, if it is the opinion uh, and the desire to do it differently moving forward, um, there could be one of two things that happen. We reduce the amount of coverage at night um, that we do quote unquote enforcement, um, or uh, there might, might be a cost that gets charged to the general fund that we would need to plan for so we can continue uh, providing the services. Um, this, you know, we, we work really hard to run this in a way that it doesn't affect the uh, uh, the tax the taxpayer. Um, so that's I believe that's that's two questions of Alderman Clemens. Alderman Clemens, was there a third question? Yeah. Uh, well, the third question is what? So I guess my my 
I'm not sure that you answered my question. I know you said you're not sure where it would go as far as if it would affect personnel um, staffing levels that we have now, but. So let me further clarify my, that. We, we don't have an overnight parking person dedicated solely to that shift. So if we were to, let's, let's say, not do as much overnight parking enforcement moving forward, you know, the person that was working would just have to look to pick up hours in, uh, in other enforcement times. I do think there are shifts available. So I don't think that that necessarily would be a problem. Um, no, so I don't think there, we're... Aren't there positions funded by these fees? Yes. There's so that's my question is, is, is the $250,000 loss going to prohibit us from, in other words, are we gonna have to lay somebody off because we're not collecting enough tickets or we're not raising enough revenue? And so I'm gonna say the answer is potentially yes, in the sense that we won't be raising enough revenue, but we might need to put on, you know, I would want to check and look at it further before I answered your question, but I, I, I would work really hard not to lay anyone off. And I understand that. And I, and I, I, I know you would, and I think we all would. Um, the other, the other two questions were more of, and again, I'm, I'm thinking that based on your answer there, that you're going to need to dig into this more, but is what things we would not be able to do without that money. And then would there be some kind of sweep? Spot compromise uh, in the middle, but I guess from based on your answers this evening, that the, all three of those questions you're going to have to look into more. I really, I really would, Alvin Clevens. Um, I, I, in terms of a sweet spot compromise, if you're suggesting splitting the difference between the 25 now and the 10, I guess my point would be is it's not really about the fine; it's about changing the behavior. And in fact, what I you know, think a parking study is going to show is, is that you, you really actually should be charging more of a fine than less to actually get mm -hmm. compliance. Now, whether that's something that this group or others want to take on someday, you know, that's, that's what I think the data is eventually going to show you. Um, the, and so, so that's, so that's anyway, one point. The second point would be, um, what this pays for are parking related costs and parking related expenses. Um, so it doesn't necessarily need to get picked up by um, the residential taxpayer. So for example, there have been co conversations about in making improvements at the high street garage uh, for everyone's benefit. So people will enjoy the high street garage more. Um, so that doesn't get borne by the taxpayers. I was thinking that the, that that would be an expense that this type of fund would cover. Whatever those improvements may be, additional lighting, uh, potential security guard, um, um, uh, um, capital maintenance to, to, in terms of drainage repairs and you know whatnot. Those, those types of, um, you know, Miscellaneous expenses that are parking related get gets covered by um, by this by this account. Okay, Th thank you very much. Okay, so before I ask if anyone else has questions, do you feel that there should be a time for this to be tabled so that the economic development director can get? The answers to the questions that Alderman Clements made, also to look at fee costs from other major cities, or do you want to uh, push forward with the motion? Anyone? I have an opinion. Alderman Lopez. I think this is exactly what I was seeing happen in the infrastructure committee and commented on before it happened that you you just continue to expand the question until it becomes an unsolvable question and say that you need more time to, to solve it. I think the objection that was being raised was that we didn't have anybody from economic development to speak to it and they're here. So I, I don't know if it matters whether he's here or not, because apparently we're going to oppose it regardless of what's presented. Okay, so Alderman Lopez, 
<laughs> let me finish. Alderman Lopez, you, you have the economic development director here, late, mm -hmm. which is fine. He's telling you he can't give you all the answers to the question. So you're looking to make a vote, to vote one way or the other, good, bad, or indifferent, mm -hmm. based on not having all the information that he might be able to give you at another time. That's all I'm, that, that's- the I think you're mischaracterizing what I said. I think Alderman Clemens asked those questions. And what was delivered was that Director Cummings, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Director Cummings, in your own words, but when Alderman Clemens asked if this was going to result in layoffs, Director Cummings said that he couldn't say that it would result in layoffs tonight. He needs to study it further in order to confirm what Alderman Clemens asked would happen. The initial presentation was that he would work very hard to have it avoid that. And then I think the follow-up question was, what other things will this, will this take from the table if we do reduce the revenue, projects such as a hypothetical project to improve High Street Garage. So, no, I don't think any of my concerns were actually addressed at all. If I were to bring a concern, my I guess my question would be, if this is intended to change behaviors, how is our plan to change behaviors entirely dependent on those behaviors continuing as they are? If we're really trying to change people from parking overnight unnecessarily as an option, then there's an assumption there that they're parking unnecessarily. And then there's also the assumption that this fee is going to deter them. Director Cummings sounds like he says that this fee does not deter them because it's not high enough. And I would revisit the assumption that people are unnecessarily parking on street overnight, as opposed to what the genesis of this legislation was, was that they're doing it in order to be safe in many cases because they might've had too much to drink or they're doing it because they live in the area and they don't have other choices. So, so if I, so if I may, if, if I may, I'll, uh, I'll woman, Karen. Yeah. Okay. You may. If, if the Genesis is this, that it needs to be, if someone needs to be safe and they don't want to drive the vehicle, as I understood what was just said, we have a whole process set up that can allow for that. It's called an overnight exception process where someone can call in 24 seven, put in their name, put in the vehicle, put in where it is. It, it's then immediately put out to the, to the parking enforcement folks. And, um, and, and, you know, so long as it's not abused, um, you know, it, it is absolutely something that's done that keeps people from getting tickets. They just need to, to follow that process. So that's an example, I think, of ways to address problem behavior without simply finding people, it's actually market that, promote it, make sure that it's known and that, that that situation does exist. And then I think likewise, that also suggests that there are solutions other than simply raising fees or continuing the process despite objection. Okay. All right. If we have no other new things to talk about, I guess, um, Madam Clerk, if you would, uh, put the motion out again so that we can do a roll. Well, actually, roll call. Uh, um, Attorney Karen, I mean, I'm sorry, Alderman Karen. This is Elizabeth. <laughs> yes, Alderman Lowe. Yes. I, I have a question for um, Mr. Cummings. Okay, thank, go ahead. Thank you. Now that we have him here, um, I think I understand that the, the budget for parking uh, operations is is um total parking operations cost or 728,000 no uh i'm sorry that is the revenue is that no. correct no okay um i'm just looking at the um city what? of nashua fiscal 2021 budget am i on the wrong page what you're referring to is the revenue that gets transferred from um parking operations lease fees for instance not the money that we're talking about tonight which is parking enforcement and that 728 is what goes to the general fund and then the excess revenue above and beyond that uh, gets transferred into a trust fund that supports the downtown improvement committee so above the 728 full revenue to be accurate you're looking somewhere in the vicinity of 
uh, depending on the year, somewhere between 900 and, and a million dollars, you know, I would say 900,000 on average. I'm not sure I understood you. Are you saying that the actual um, revenue from parking operations is a, is a million? Uh, just under a million. Okay. All right. And the co and the and the appropriations are four hundred thousand. And so I I'm just um, so yeah. yeah again. I, I, again, I just want to be clear. There are essentially two different departments. You have parking operations and then you have parking enforcement. And so when you say the 400 figure, I'm not exactly sure which uh, one you're. You're right. Okay. All right. I guess I can't get into this. I thought maybe we could get a sense of um, what the costs were versus the income. But um, a thought I had as, as I was listening to people talk is that um, well, I guess my thought was based on looking at operations rather than enforcement. Operations must be a higher revenue than enforcement, isn't it? Uh, yes, I think that's fair to say, yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you, Alderman Lou. Madam Clerk, are you ready to uh, put the motion out for this piece of legislation? I believe the motion on the floor is still to recommend final passage by roll call. There have been no okay. other. No other hands. Unless right. I missed one. Unless okay. I missed one. Okay. Will the clerk please call the roll? Alderman Karen. No. Alderman Clemens. No. Alderman Lopez. Yes. Alderman Kelly votes yes. Alderman Cleaver. Yes. You have three yeas, two nays. Okay. Motion uh, passes three to two. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Cummings. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. So, um, Madam Chair, would you, uh, Madam Clerk, would you take off the table 0 20 009? Uh, move to take 0 20 from the table by roll call. Okay. Thank you. Please Alderman call Karen. The roll. And making yes. sure there's no discussion. Any hands? I'm sorry. Alderman Karen. Yes. Alderman Clemens. Yes. Alderman Lopez. Yes. Alderman Kelly. Uh, yes. Alderman Cleaver. Yes. Okay. Motion is to take off the table 0 20 009. Madam Clerk. Uh, for purposes of discussion, I will move for final passage by roll call. And Alderman okay. Dad has his name. Yeah, I see it. Um, okay, motion is to, for final passage of 0 20 009 as amend amended and Alderman Dowd is here to speak on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as the main um, drafter of this, I would like to explain the rationale. <clears throat> the revisions to the Board of Alderman's Rules of Order of Business, Section 5-14 Order of Business, as proposed by Ordinance 020-009. This ordinance and the clarifications proposed for revision this evening is not meant to overly restrict the public's input to the Board of Aldermen. Rather, its intent is to provide some clarification and guidance to these procedures. The full intent of the ordinance is to establish guidelines to structure public comment to allow more than one person to comment on an evening's agenda 
or comment in general at the end of the meeting. The board has had the aforementioned rules in place for some time, limiting public comment to 15 minutes with a provision to allow that it be extended if there were more people who wanted to provide input and the majority of the board were okay with extending the period of public comment. For the most part, this has been the practice we have followed, but we have often had this period monopolized by individuals who often went beyond their five minute restriction with their comments and often went beyond the 15 minute allowance. Some also commented at the first 15 minute period on items not provided for by these rules of order. The first public comment period is restricted by current rules to communications requiring final approval by the Board of Aldermen that evening or other items that are going to be acted upon that evening for final approval. Let me be clear that we don't wish to limit what anyone can provide for public comment and that is why we have allowed for the public's ability to provide written comments to the board and have them included as part of the meeting minutes. As part of the meeting minutes, these comments are available as well to the general public. All public input requires a name and address to be included with both oral and written comments. This revised ordinance also clarifies what may be addressed at each public comment period as a guide to whoever is chairing the full board meeting or chairing the committee meeting. It further clarifies that a speaker providing oral comments in either public comment period be limited to three minutes and they may only speak once. This allows a person to clearly state their position on any items of business and no one may delegate any part of their time to another speaker. This is a rule followed by most Board of Aldermen and Selectmen meetings in New Hampshire, and has actually been followed by most of our uh, uh, public committee meetings. Further clarification identifies that this public comment period is for comment only and not a question and answer period with the Board of Aldermen. Only the chairperson may receive a question and determine if someone answering this question will help clarify the item being discussed. The chairperson may answer the question or designate the one person who may answer the question. Public comment periods are not to allow speeches on any subject and all discussions should be relevant to items that fall under the purview of the Board of Aldermen or the committee conducting that hearing. Again, the public has the ability to provide written comments to the board via mail or email, which may be included in the minutes of the full board of committee meetings or jurisdiction on that subject. Matters that are under the purview of the administrative branch of the city of Nashua should be addressed to the mayor's office and not the board of aldermen. Um, the three minutes is something that we've been using in public hearings for quite some time. And we had a very large one recently on, on the um, bond for the PUC in the, in the parking garage. And it worked very well because I ran the meeting and I have a stopwatch and I time everyone. And 90 to 95% of everyone finishes within three minutes. And, and if they run a little over, I, we don't call them unless they go get to five minutes. Then we tell them that they have to wrap it up. But this has worked quite well. And I advocate for the passage of R2009. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Alderman Dowd. Do we have any questions from committee members first? Alderman Lopez has hands up. Alderman Lopez. Uh, I have a question for uh, through the chair to Alderman Dowd, actually, about the formation of this. In the notes that we were provided for this, uh, the fiscal impact or the fiscal uh, analysis just says none. Um, just to be clear, is that because one wasn't done or because it has no impact? It has no impact. Okay. Um, I guess I'm surprised by that just because when public comment runs long and sometimes it runs quite long, uh, we do have people that are transcribing, we have people that are running the video footage. Um, and I think, I mean, that's definitely worth considering. If we pass this, that will alleviate some of that concern. Yeah, I just would be interested in um, maybe if 
had want to spend more staff time than this ends up saving. But if somebody be able to just comb through really quickly and for some of the more notable examples, what it looks like when we don't have a public comment within a reasonable amount of time, it actually costs the city because we're running everything. Like we still have the lights on and people, you know, running this through the TV. Uh, still have the transcribers and the aldermanic assistant trying to run things. And I think that does have an impact. And I don't know that um, your average person really makes a difference, but some of the, the uh, more notable speakers definitely definitely make an impact on the system, I think. And I, and I will say that this re review was uh, had extensive review and comment and clarifications from legal. Okay. Well, like I said, I trust the experts in their analysis. I was just a little surprised that it said none. It may be just because it's so hard to quantify. Okay. And anyone else? I have questions. All the woman Kelly. I'm laughing at myself because I'm raising my hand, but you can't see me. You cannot see you. It's late. <laughs> So I have a few questions, probably through you, um, Alder Woman Karen, to um, Alderman Dowd. Um, mm -hmm. Just a couple of clarifications that, I mean, I think this makes a lot of sense and I appreciate the work that you've done here. Uh, one of the things that I was hoping to see in here was a mechanism, can you all hear me? Yes. Uh, a mechanism yeah. for keeping track of this time. I know that there are other cities that have a very specific mechanism for keeping that time and making sure that we stay to it. Um, so I, if you would be open to, oh, Alderman Wilshire has her hand up. I was going to defer to Alderman Wilshire and I think that she can answer the question based on the new guidance and the, and the uh, renovation of City Hall. Right, <clears throat> now that we have a brand new Aldermanic chamber sitting there due to COVID, we haven't been able to use it, which is unfortunate. Um, but we did put a time piece in there, a time clock that the clerk will set when someone speaks. And there's a little um, light that sits on the closest desk to the microphone that the speaker can see, letting them know when their time is up. It's a red, yellow, green light. Do you like think we need the to planning include board. that? Do we need to uh, include question, that is, in is that the, the one that's over there? That's that's over right by the door. I think. Okay. Uh, too many people are talking. All the woman Kelly has the no, I think Kelly has uh, the thank you. thank you. Um do we need to include that in the legislation so that we can be very clear that your three minutes will be, you know, taken by time clock and you'll be notified X, Y, and Z. I think that might be a, a question of legal. Yes, and I asked legal that specifically since we just did all those renovations and they preferred it not be in the legislation at this time. Mm, okay, that's interesting. Um, the only other one I had a question, if I could continue, Alderman Karen. Yes. The only other one I had a question, I believe you added this, and it's semantic, but that's who I am. <laughs> um, the idea of number, I think it says 10, remarks shall be civil, ruder, profane remarks are prohibited. I just feel like that's so subjective. Like what I think is civil and what, you know, Alderman Wilshire thinks is civil. And I, I know that part of that is the chair's, um, chair's prerogative, but if someone wants to be rude, I don't think we should tell them they can't be rude. I would prefer they wouldn't be, um, but. The, uh, again, legal specified these words and suggested that we use this and it is up to the purview of the chairperson of the, either the board of all of the meeting or the committee. I guess my question is, it is, I think this is still effective if we strike it and that idea of whether it's rude or not is up to the chair. It's not like suddenly we have more legislative effectiveness by saying people can't be rude. I, I think it becomes then subjective to the to the chair and this gives some guidance and backup to the chair that they can use this and I say it's part of of the ordinance and 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 that if you are rude or or 
not applying by the rules, the ordinance says that she can, she or he can stop you from talking. Um, I guess my comment is I, I still just, I know you, you started out by saying you don't want to muzzle anybody or, or allow them not to speak. And I think that if someone's fired up, that can come off as being rude. And I don't think that we should have the ability to tell someone they can't talk. Again, this is used by most boards of aldermen and, and selectmen in the state of New Hampshire. Anything else, Alderman Kelly? I'm done. Alderman Lopez has his hand up. Okay, Alderman Lopez. Um, would it be possible to insert a line? Um, I'm asking this before I make an amendment to that effect, um, which specifically references that uh, a comments being addressed to the Board of Aldermen must be addressed to the Board of Aldermen and not to people specifically, and must reference the role of the Board of Aldermen. Some examples of um, breaches of that that I see pretty regularly are when somebody takes the opportunity to use public comment to target the mayor and dispute his policy or his actions. That's not the board of aldermen's fault. He's in a he's the mayor. Um, he can do what he's going to do. If they're asking us to take action, then it has to be within an appropriate rule of role of ours as well. And then likewise, if they're criticizing an individual staff member of the city. I really don't think that's our role at all to, to weigh in on that kind of stuff um, and, and interfere with the, the human resources process. So is, would it be possible to amend this or add to it uh, a condition that public comment should be made to the Board of Aldermen upon topics that the Board of Aldermen has purview over and addressed to the Board of Aldermen, not other members of the public or whatever? I, I actually think that's pretty well covered in the wording. and. Uh... There's places where it says must be germane to the meeting's agenda. And there's another place, uh, uh, if I can find it, that the, they can only address things that we have authority over. So if they say they're upset with the mayor because he did this or that, and we don't have authority over telling him what he can do, that's not germane to the Board of Aldermen. So it could not be allowed. Okay, well, uh, I guess the, my uh, proposed or I guess anticipated amendment is unnecessary. Um, so I appreciate you, you putting that in there because personally, I think that members of the public don't understand the liability they're pulling the city into. When they start criticizing individuals like that, we don't need to be, I don't know the implications of being a, a public uh, employee and suddenly having yourself subject to criticism in a public forum but I don't think we necessarily should be enabling that in any way. That's not what we're here for. Yeah, I think Alderman Clemens wants to address it, but I, I, I think that the chairperson should certainly limit people that are getting out of line with, with uh, making derogatory comments about any individuals that work for the city, because I don't think that's correct. I can't call on you. I have to give that to June. <laughs> okay. Alderman, Alderman Lopez. Alderman Clemens. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't think that that what you said was in is in the ordinance. Um, there because it is. the we we only made the first public comment period germane to the agenda, and the second public comment period is still open. Um, and in my opinion, that's that's the way it should be. I I, I don't agree with um, Alderman Lopez on on that um, that it should only be germane to the board. I think if somebody wants to come to speak to the board of aldermen, they should be able to do that and give us their opinion on the mayor, or you know give us their opinion on you know the president or or, or whatever it is. Um, in the second public comment period, so long as they do so within a three minute time period. Um, so I don't see that in this legislation and I wouldn't support putting it in. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, then will the clerk please call the roll?
Alderman Karen. Alderman Karen. No, I'm here. Yes. Alderman Clemens. Yes. Alderman Lopez. Yes. Alderman Kelly's a yes. Alderman Cleaver. Yes. You have five yeas and zero nays. Okay. So motion 020-009 has passed. Thank you, Alderman Dowd, for coming to the meeting. You're welcome. All right. We're on to thank you. We're on to general discussion. Any general discussion? Any hands up? Seeing none. Any public comment? Anyone from the public? Okay, seeing none, remarks by the alderman. I don't Anyone? see anybody. Okay, uh, it looks like we have no need for a non-public session. So, Madam Clerk, I move to adjourn by roll call. Okay, motion is to adjourn by roll call. Alderman Karen? Yes. Alderman Clemens? Yes. Alderman Lopez? Yes. Alderman Kelly say yes. Alderman Cleaver? Yes. You have five yes and zero nays. Okay, then I thank you all. And we are adjourned at 9.26 p.m. See you tomorrow. Night, everyone. Bye. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.